From eastern lands they journeyed, kings heavy laden with gifts for the king. From nearby fields they journeyed, shepherds empty-handed but full-hearted for the shepherd. From Nazareth they journeyed, newlyweds with nowhere to stay, expecting and expectant. They journeyed into the night. Would you turn in your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. So there was an older man, a Scottish man. He lived in Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, he, uh, had, um, he and his wife had two adult children that lived down in London, so pretty far away, down south in England. And a few days before Christmas, the old man got on the phone and called his son down in London and said, I've got terrible news. Your mother and I are getting a divorce. Been married to her 40 years, tried to change her, kind of do it. I'm giving up. And uh, he said, uh, his son said, Dad, don't do it, don't do it. Please, don't do it. We're, I'm coming up. We've got to talk about this. And uh, then the, the old man said, it's too late, I've tried. Call your sister, I'm tired of talking about it. And he hung up. So brother calls sister, says mom and dad are getting a divorce, horrible news, bad, bad, bad news. She calls dad and says, dad, please don't do this. I'm coming up, I, we got to talk about this. So then when... Uh, the old man hung up the phone. He turns to his wife with a big smile, grabs her hand, and says, They're coming for Christmas, and we do not have to pay a thing. Good Scotsman there. You know, <laughs> what's terrible news for some people is good news for other people. What was terrible news for Herod the Great, a baby has been born, the king of the Jews, when he heard that news, not good news for him. But for the wise men, it was great news, and for the world, it continues to be great news. We have been talking about a single theme the last few weeks. The theme is Into the Night, and the first message on that was found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem, they were turned into the night by the innkeeper. Then we followed that up with the shepherds who were watching their flocks by night. They went out into the night to come to Bethlehem to find Jesus. After they found him, they went back out into the night to tell everybody about the event. Now we look at this very famous story of a group of travelers who are from the east, and they are following a star. It's in Matthew chapter 2, the story of the wise men. Now, you know the night sky has been a source for navigation for centuries. In fact, most of world history, people have found their way around by looking at the stars. Uh, technology that we enjoy, like satellites, GPS, all that's recent. Uh, but for generations, people looked up at the sky, found the North Star, observed the movement of constellations, uh, figured out latitude and longitude, and took their journey. So uh, caravans and ships and armies have all used the stars to find their course for travel. But this star is markedly different. This star is very unusual, as you probably already know, and at least you will see. Now, a couple of preliminaries about this Christmas story. And the first thing you need to know is it did not happen at Christmas. Uh, it must have happened several months later, and because it says in chapter 2, verse 1, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, we're not giving a a time signature here, so we don't know how much time, but after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Then go down to verse 11 and notice that uh, 
in verse 11 that Jesus is no longer in a stable. He's not out in a caravansary where he may have been born. But it says, and when they had come into the house. So he's in some kind of uh, abode, some kind of a house, some rented house that they're uh, enjoying in uh, the city of Bethlehem. And he's no longer a baby, for it says, when they had come into the house, they saw the young child. So because of this, most scholars, most commentators believe that it has been about uh, 13 months to 24 months later that the wise men show up in Bethlehem. Well, what that means is we should be singing We Three Kings of Orient are like uh, in a year or a year and a half or something like that. And, and perhaps um, we shouldn't be singing it at all uh, because uh, there weren't necessarily three kings uh, we say three. Why do we call it, say there's three kings? Because of the what? The gifts, because there's gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So somebody just came along and said, well, there's three gifts, three kings. Uh, but it doesn't say there were three kings. That's number one. Number two, they weren't kings. They're looking for a king. We want to find the one who has been born the king of the Jews, but they themselves are not kings. And, and then third, they're really not from the Orient as we know the Orient, like China or Japan or, or um, Myanmar or any of those Oriental places. They're from the Middle East, but they are from a place east of where Israel is. So to really understand the story, um, I want to fill in some historical blanks, if you don't mind, uh, today. And to do that, I'm going to have to strip away some of the baggage uh, sometimes we don't like that. You know, you, you take away the baggage from the Christmas songs and from the Christmas cards, and you get down to really what happened. So we want to look at this, and, and we want to look at, first of all, their identity, the identity of these magi, these wise men. Look at verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. It's not a lot of information, but that's all we got. We have this, plus a little bit of ancient history, plus some texts in the Old Testament that will help us get a composite of their identity, who they were. They seem to come out of nowhere. They get an audience with Herod, and they scare the snot out of everybody in Jerusalem. By just showing up, it moves Herod, it troubles him, and everybody else with him. So, over the years, traditions have developed, myths have developed, and ladies and gentlemen, for a second appearance, we have, from my nativity set, the three wise men. I picked them up and looked at them. I looked at them really close. I've looked at them all my life, but I, I really examined them. And uh, I could see by looking at them the myths that we have developed over time. So somebody came along in history and said, the three wise men are three representatives of the sons of Noah. The sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So um, that is why you have one that looks a brown, one that looks black, and one that looks white. That's... That's how the nativity set shows them. In the Middle Ages, somebody came up with their names. Their names are, supposedly, Gaspar, Balthazar, and Melchior, from Arabia, Ethiopia, and Tarsus. Um, Marco Polo came along, not the guy who invented the game in the swimming pool. There was an actual Marco Polo <laughs> around the 1300s. And he claimed to discover the town from which they began their journey and to which they came back and were buried. Now, I'm looking at these little figures here. Uh, two of them have crowns, and one looks like uh, an English king or a French king of some kind. So um, I'm just going to chalk this as being very, very inaccurate. In the 12th century, in Cologne, Germany, a guy by the name of... Uh, uh, the uh, German bishop named Reinhold of Cologne 
claimed to have found the skulls of the three kings. And if you go to the cathedral today, they still claim the skulls are in a repository in that church. He knew, he said he knew they were the three magi because he said their eyes were still in their sockets and they were fixed toward Jerusalem. See, this is all myth. Nobody really knows how many there were. Nobody knows their names. Nobody knows how they got to Jerusalem, what they rode on. Probably not camels. Uh, all we know is they came from the east. It says, wise men from the east. Now, those words, wise men, it's one word in Greek, magoi. Magoi, that's where we get our term magi or magi. History tells us that the magoi, the magi, came from Medo-Persia or present-day Iran, that part of the world. The Greek historian named Herodotus said they were a priestly caste of Medes from Parthia or Persia and Mesopotamia. At one time, they tried to overthrow the Persian Empire. They were unsuccessful. Instead, they became priests, advisors to royalty, advisors to kings. Get this. They were a hereditary priesthood. Very similar to Judaism where you have a single hereditary priesthood, the Levites. You had to be a Levite to be a priest, and you pass that on generation to generation. So it was very similar to that. Also, they were monotheistic. They believed in worshiping one God, not a multiplicity of gods like so many other religious systems. They were monotheistic. They saw fire as their principal object of worship or element for worship. So they had one altar that had a perpetual flame burning, and they had another altar on which they conducted animal sacrifices. Again, very similar to Judaism. But... For all intents and purposes, they were pagans. They believed in sorcery. They believed in both astronomy and astrology. They didn't really see a difference between those two disciplines. And they practiced divination. Our word magic and magician comes from the term magi. It's simply a corruption of the word or term magi. Also, our word magistrate comes from the term magi because of the influence that they had on governments. The code of the magi was known as the law of the Medes and the Persians. And you may have read that phrase in the Old Testament book of Daniel. It shows up three times, the law of the Medes and the Persians. That was the code of the magi. We know that they were living in Babylon, and they were in Medo-Persia in both of those empires as high-ranking officials. In fact, you know the story from your Bible that Nebuchadnezzar invaded different parts of the world. And in 586 B.C., he invaded Jerusalem and brought a group of captives to Babylon and one very famous Jewish kid by the name of Daniel, as we know Daniel the prophet. Now, Daniel was important to the Magi because Nebuchadnezzar one night has a dream, doesn't remember what it was, or at least he says he doesn't remember what it was. And so he says to his uh, court of magicians and Chalde Chal Chaldeans and Magi, I had a dream last night. I need the interpretation. They said, no problem. Tell us what it was, and we'll tell you what it meant. And he goes, nope, that's too easy. You tell me what I dreamed and what it meant, or you're dead. So uh, they get all up in their pajamas over that. And in Daniel chapter 2, it says, The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magi, magician translated here, astrologer or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Well, we know the story. Daniel comes along and goes, there's a God in heaven who knows the answer, and he's going to tell me what it is, and I'm going to tell the king. He does, and he saves the bacon of the magi, right? Uh, they're very grateful to Daniel for saving their lives. Nebuchadnezzar makes Daniel 
the head over them all. Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, Nebuchadnezzar made him ruler over the whole area of Babylon and put him in charge of all the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel exerted influence on the ancient hereditary priesthood known as the Magi. Fast forward now to Bethlehem. When their descendants show up in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east. We've come to worship him. When they showed up in Jerusalem, I'm guessing far more than three most commentators and historians think it was a large entourage. They were not on camels. They would have been on fine Arabian steeds or Persian steeds. And get this, the Magi were known by their hats. They wore these tall, conical hats with long ear flaps that went down past their chin. They were quite a sight to behold. Coneheads uh, coming into Jerusalem, and um, everybody got stirred up when they saw them. And yet here we are, still singing, We three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar when actually we should be singing, we huge entourage of Parthian astronomers are from Iran, bearing gifts we traverse afar. But that would never pass the songwriting committee, so we're stuck with we three kings. That's their identity. What I want you to notice now is their inquiry. Verse 2. They said, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Interesting, they're not Jews. They're not from Judea. They are Gentiles. But their question is, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. It's always fascinated me. They didn't even have to think or check on their little computer or iPhone. Where's that text? Where's that scripture? They just knew it. Top of their heads. Memorized it. Micah 5.2. Quoted it. But they're so legalistic and religiously indifferent that that's all they do is quote the scripture and turn over and do their thing. They don't go looking for him. So they come to town. They ask the question, and it says, Herod was troubled. Troubled. The word troubled means agitated. Think of your washing machine. Agitated. Uh, It means deeply shaken, deeply perturbed, And all Jerusalem with them. Everybody's troubled. You know why everybody's troubled? Because Herod's troubled. Sort of like, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. If Herod ain't happy, nobody's happy. And if Herod is troubled, everybody is troubled. Why is Herod troubled? Because the question is, where's the king? How is Herod introduced here? Herod the king. In fact, Herod was called king of the Jews. So when they come to town in these conical hats with this huge entourage, and they go, we're here to worship the king of the Jews. Do you know where he is? He goes, what, what? I'm the king of the Jews. Now, let me give you a little bit of history about Herod, Herod the king, Herod the great. When Herod heard this question, he was threatened, obviously, um, because not only is another king born, but a Jewish king, a Jewish king. Now, something about Herod. Herod was not Jewish. Herod was Idumean or Edomite. He came originally from peoples that were neighbors of the Jewish nation. How did he get to the position? He got to this position by his father. His dad was a guy by the name of Antipater. Antipater once did Rome a favor, and the Caesar at the time, Julius Caesar, gave him Judea to rule over. And when his son, called here Herod the king or Herod the great, when his son gets to the throne, 
He was given the title by Rome, King of the Jews, and he loved that title. And history remembers Herod as a very wicked tyrant, killing anybody who would rival him or mess with his title, King of the Jews. Let me give you an example of how he was a tyrant. He killed, he killed one of his own wives named Miriamne, and he killed two of his eldest sons so they couldn't take his throne. And there was a saying going around that it's safer to be Herod's pig than it is his son. And he was such a whack job of, of just paranoia that he knew everybody hated him and he knew that when he died nobody would care. And so when he was on his deathbed, in, in our story he's about 70 years of age. When he's on his deathbed, not too far from this event, he gave the command to arrest all the nobility in Jerusalem, all the noble, known, wealthy, important people of the city, to incarcerate them until his death, and that at the moment of his death, execute them all. And here's why. I know that when I die, nobody will cry, but I want to make sure there is mourning in Jerusalem upon my death kill them all. That's the kind of guy we're dealing with here. So you understand when these Parthian kingmakers show up with their conical hats and huge entourage, and they go, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Herod's troubled. That's an understatement. He's shaken deeply. He is, he is perturbed. He is agitated. So the Magi were kingmakers from the east, the ones who would consult royalty about political matters. And at this time in Persia, in Parthia, where they are from, there was a ruling body made up entirely of magi who alone had the sole choice of the next king. And magi were so powerful that no Persian was able to become king unless, number one, he had mastered the science and religious discipline of the Magi. And number two, he had to be approved of and crowned by the Magi. You see the kind of power they had to make kings. Something else I think is important. At this time, the Parthians, the Magi, had a king where they lived. They didn't like him. His name was Phraates, Phraates IV. And Phraates IV at one time had fought against Rome and there had been lots of rivalry between that kingdom and Rome. And the people of Parthia, including the Magi, wanted their king to rebel against Caesar Augustus, who's now the Caesar, overthrow him and kill him so that the Persians could once again become a world empire like they once had been. And because their king was a little bit fickle and they didn't like him, they're searching. They wanted another king. And so when they come... And they're the rival kingdom to the Roman Empire. And they say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Herod knew all this. And there's something else Herod knew. Herod knew that there was a feeling around the Roman Empire that the next big ruler would be from Judea. A lot of people don't know this. But there are two Roman historians that bear this out. One is named Suetonius, and I'll put his quote up on the screen. Uh, Suetonius wrote, and I quote, There had spread all over the Orient an old and established belief that it was fated at that time for men coming from Judea to rule the world. Another one named Tacitus wrote, there was a firm persuasion at that very time the East was to grow powerful and rulers coming from Judea were to acquire a universal empire. So when these guys show up in Jerusalem and Herod, who works for Rome, by the way, remember Caesar Octavian was renamed Caesar Augustus by the Roman Senate, and Caesar Augustus was also called by the Roman Senate the savior of the world. So when these guys show up looking for a Jewish-born king of the Jews, rivaling Rome, that's how Herod sees it, he thinks of one thing, I gotta kill him, I gotta kill him. 
Now let's consider their astronomy. They're following a star, we are told in verse 2. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Get down to verse 7. Herod, when he secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, uh, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Such a rat. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east, went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. Apparently the star led them to Jerusalem and then it disappeared for a few days. They went to meet with Herod. Then uh, they go outside one night. There it is again because in verse uh, 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now what is this star? What is this thing in the sky that they see? What is it exactly? Well, <laughs> Take your pick. There's lots of theories about this, and I, I always marvel every Christmas season you can count on National Geographic Channel coming up with yet another theory. We know now what the Bethlehem star was. There's just so much talk about what that was. Nobody really knows what it is. Uh, I have books and commentaries, and there's a lot of ink has been spent and um, things have been written guessing what it might be. Uh, Alfred Edersheim, the uh, Jewish scholar, said, uh, perhaps a conjunction of planets, Jupiter and Saturn, in the constellation Pisces. Eh, maybe. Um, others say uh, supernova, that is a star that explodes and emits light for weeks, even months. Um, or others say a comet in the Earth's rotation. Others say a low-hanging luminous meteor in the night sky. Honestly, I don't care. I don't care what it was. I mean, I, I, I hear all this arguing. What is the story? What can it be? We have to discover. Listen, listen, listen. God became an embryo. That's the news. Uh, the embryo grew into fetus, and he was born in Bethlehem. God in human flesh. Don't care about the star. What I care about and what's important to the story is that a king has been born who is God in human flesh, and even Gentile kingmakers knew that. That's, that's the intent. That's why Matthew includes it. Whatever it was, it was something unusual because if you'll notice in verse 2, they, they don't say we have seen a star or we have seen the star. We have seen his star, his star. It indicates it's something very unusual. It must have been unusual to motivate them to travel 500 miles from Parthia to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem. What exactly it was is, again, inconsequential. The point is, even Gentiles, foreigners, knew of his birth. And here's my guess, just a guess. If it's anything supernatural, and that's what it is, it's supernatural, it's miraculous, I think it was the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, it's, it's what we have in the Scripture that led the children of Israel through the wilderness. They could actually see the glory of God. It showed up as a pillar of fire at night, led them for 40 years in the wilderness. And the glory of God shone around the shepherds. It was something luminous. Uh, the prophet Ezekiel uh, saw the glory of God like a light form leave the temple, and he could see it travel from the threshold of the temple to the eastern gate, from the eastern gate to the Mount of Olives, and then disappear. So it's something that you could see that traveled and moved and shone. So if it's anything that fits the description I read here, it would be that. So the Magi had been in Babylon four years, four generations, four centuries. They had previously come in contact with Daniel, who made them aware of Jewish prophecy. Not just Jewish prophecy, but in particular messianic prophecy. Remember, it was Daniel who was given the information about Messiah the Prince. Those are Daniel's words, Messiah the Prince. And he wrote in Daniel 9, Messiah the Prince. 
It was Daniel who in chapter 7 had a vision of the Son of Man. And the Son of Man goes to the Ancient of Days, and the Son of Man is given an everlasting kingdom. That, that came to Daniel. It was Daniel who interpreted the dream that everybody, including all the Magi, knew about. Uh, Daniel interpreted the dream of the king as there's going to be a series of kingdoms. Um, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. And eventually a king is coming whose reign will be over the entire earth. All of that came through Daniel the prophet. So Daniel, as well as other Jews living there, had influence on the expectation of the Magi, probably even sharing other Old Testament scriptures. Imagine Daniel, for example, sharing this with the ancient Magi. Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Or Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, on them a great light has shined. Or Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3. The Gentiles shall come to your light. These men were Gentiles. And kings to the brightness of your rising. I'm guessing that those scriptures, along with what Daniel talked about, just kept their senses heightened, and when that appeared in the sky, they said, boys, this is, this is it. Let's take that trip. That was their astronomy. Now let's finish out the story in what I consider is really the best part, and that is their humility. Verse 9, when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star, which they had seen in the east, went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was. This is, again, why I think uh, it wasn't a comet or a meteor or a supernova, because they don't, like, stop over houses. I don't know where you live in town, but you might look up at the North Star or the Milky Way or, the, or Pleiades or whatever you're looking at. It's not, like, over just your house, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So uh, this is something very, very singular. Uh, and I love verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. I just love the way that is worded. It could have just said they were happy or they were joyful or they rejoiced. But no, they rejoiced, and not just with joy, but exceedingly great joy. My translation, they were stoked. <laughs> they were stoked. This wasn't just, yeah, that's nice. Wow. They, yeah, yoo-hoo. Exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary. By the way, when Matthew writes about Mary, it's always he mentions Jesus first. It's because he's the focus, and these guys don't worship her. They worship him. So it's the child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Whatever sort of wise men they were before, they're really wise now because they bowed down and they worshiped Jesus. I, I believe, my belief, these aren't just Gentiles. These are God-fearing Gentiles. And that when they looked down and they saw that child, uh, it's protocol to bow before a king, but the word for worship is proskuneo, and it's always a word that refers to something you do to God. God alone. Jesus said to Satan, uh, you shall uh, uh, serve the Lord your God, him, uh, worship the Lord your God, him only shall you serve. The worship proskuneo, worship only God. When John, in the book of Revelation, tried to worship an angel, proskuneo an angel, the angel said, don't proskuneo me, baby, uh, proskuneo God alone. Uh, it, it's reserved only for God. So they bowed down, they worshiped this child. Because I think they looked and said, this is the Messiah Daniel spoke about. 
Um, we've been waiting for this ever since that time. So they gave him gifts, and we know them well. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold makes sense. He's a king. These are king makers. They recognize the king. And this is the king of kings. Uh, something else that I think was helpful. Joseph and Mary were poor. They were so poor that when Mary goes to the temple to get purified, the standard offering a Jewish couple brings is a lamb. But if you couldn't afford a lamb, there was a stipulation in the law, you could bring a bird, you could bring a turtle dove. And so they brought a dove for her purification, which indicates they were so poor they couldn't afford the standard offering for the purification. Keep in mind, he has quit his job in Nazareth. He has traveled all the way down to Bethlehem. The baby has been born. Jesus has been presented in the temple. All that time has elapsed. Still no job from Nazareth. Maybe he had piecemeal work while he was in Bethlehem. Plus, they're about to take a trip all the way to Egypt, very costly to travel. They were there for a couple years probably before they went back to Nazareth. So what sustained them financially for that trip? This, the gold that was given, uh, would be used to fund the trip to Egypt and to escape Herod's wrath. So they gave gold. And second, they gave frankincense, very expensive, very aromatic, a fragrance uh, from the east. There's a certain tree in Arabia that when you cut the bark, a white resin pours out that dries and crystallizes, and it emits a beautiful odor only when crushed. Only when crushed. Isaiah would say, he was crushed for our iniquities. He was bruised for our sins. Frankincense is what the priest would use in giving the meal offering. Jesus is not just a king, but he is our great high priest. The third gift is the gift of myrrh, which is like the odd gift. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the gift from your weird uncle at Christmas. You go, huh, yeah, you really missed on that one. Uh, but thanks, uncle. You know, it's like, hmm. It's an aromatic, beautiful-smelling substance myrrh is, but at the time of Christ, it was used principally for two reasons. Number one, as an anesthetic for great pain. They tried to give it to Jesus. They mixed it with wine, tried to give it to him on the cross. He wouldn't take it. And second, it was used when you die uh, to take the stench of the corrupting body away. Jesus was buried with 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes, the Scripture tells us. So, important stuff, but weird for a baby. It's like, yeah, thanks for the embalming fluid. <laughs> See ya. Unless you realize that predicted where he was going. You will call his name Jesus, the angel said to Joseph and Mary, for he will save his people from their sins. How would he do that? Death. Let me throw something else out at you just for fun. The rabbis associated myrrh with death, but not just death. The rabbis associated the substance of myrrh with sacrificial death. Sacrificial death. The rabbis connected the term myrrh with a particular mountain not far away. Because the Hebrew word for myrrh is mor, M-O-R, we would say, uh, or we would spell in English, mor. And so the rabbis associated Abraham giving his son on Mount Moriah. So myrrh, to a rabbinic scholar at that time, spoke of sacrificial death. So gold, frankincense, myrrh, and that, that is why at Christmas time we make it a point that you understand we just do not, do not celebrate a baby born in Bethlehem and yay, say out of the baby, isn't the baby cute? The baby came to die. The baby came to grow up and make claims upon people. The baby uh, came to come into the world and say, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The, the baby was born to die on a cruel cross 
for the sins of you and I to save us. There's a story about a mom. She's shopping at Christmas time with her kids. Uh, it's hectic. She's feeling pressure. Um, hours of looking at toys, hours of hearing her kids ask for every toy they have seen, feeling overwhelmed. Plus, she's thinking all the Christmas parties I have to attend and did I buy the right gift for the right person, all that. She gets on an elevator packed full of people. She's just at the brink, and she blurts out, whoever started this whole Christmas thing should be found, strung up, and shot. That's a frustrated mom. From the back of the elevator, a calm voice said, Don't worry, we've already done that. We crucified him. Dead silence in the elevator. Could have heard a pin drop because everybody knew, boy, has our focus been way off. This is why he came. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh sacrificial death. So as we bring this to a close, here's a few takeaways for you. Number one, Jesus is for all people. All people. Poor, rich, uh, Jew, Gentile. Even wise and rich people like these men needed Jesus, and they knew they needed him. They were willing to make a long trip to see him. Uh, number two, distance is no barrier. They traveled 500 miles. Um, how far are you willing to go uh, to meet Jesus, to meet up with Jesus? Are you asking all the right questions? Uh, a lot of people, I'm searching for God. Really, how are you doing that? On your cell phone all day? Or are you asking the right people the right questions, really searching through the purpose for your existence? Because when you really search for Him, the Bible says... Uh, in Jeremiah 29, 13, we always memorize 29, 11, but in 29, 13, God says, you will find me when you seek for me with all your heart. So if you search for him, you'll find him. Uh, the next thing is giving is part of worshiping. They brought gifts with them. They first gave themselves by worshiping him, and then they gave their gifts. To them, it was one and the same thing. This is the king giving us a part of worshiping. And, and the last takeaway is this. Once you meet Jesus, you'll never be the same. We're told in verse 12, I don't want to make too much of it, but I do want to draw your attention to a point. Being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now, I know what that means. It means they took a different route. But it's also true that when you come into contact with Jesus Christ, you leave differently than you came. You leave differently than you came. You come one way to Him. You leave another way. You come as a sinner to Him. You leave as a forgiven sinner. You leave as a child of God. You come one way, you leave a different way. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things become new. And I think those wise men, magoi, magi, that large group of them went back and their joy, their stokedness, continued for quite some time as they were changed by what they saw. Imagine looking in the face of Jesus and realizing that's the King of Kings. That's the King we've been anticipating. This is the Messiah Daniel spoke about. He's worth our gifts. He's worth our worship, and we've seen Him. Thank you so much for joining us for this message from Calvary Church with Skip Heitzig. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Share your story with us. Email my story at calvarynm.church. And if you'd like to support this Bible teaching ministry with a financial gift, visit calvarynm.church give.